Welcome. In this session, we'll explore total variation. This is a concept that is deep enough that it could be a course of its own topic. This, the way that we'll explore it is it's closely related to our idea of Tikhonov regularization. This is a fairly old problem going back at least to the 19th century in its current formulation, and it comes from a deceptively simple question which is consider how much does a function, and we'll put this in quotes because we're not sure what we mean by it, how much does a function vary? And the first question we should ask ourselves is vary, vary from what? And that turned out to be a key problem that took a long while to solve. Ultimately, what people did was they said, well, it varies from a measure of its derivative. So let's recall, let's recall from really basic calculus that the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is antiderivatives. And this is a wonderful notion it is that if we have a function of, that has a scalar argument, we can represent that as the integral of the derivative of the function. And that is part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And the total variation on some interval, so we go from scalar parameter value 0 to value 1 and this is defined as and there are two common definitions one is it's the integral from t0 to t1 and this is what we mean by vary is the absolute value of the derivative with respect to the scalar, or it might be the integral from t0 to t1 of we take the derivative of the function we're looking at and we square it. And there are these two competing ideas in total variation. One is to use the absolute value and one is to use the square. We'll use the squared definition because it will let us uh, um, take derivatives in a fairly straightforward manner, and we know that uh, the absolute value function has some annoying derivative properties at zero. Now, let's take a look at what that would what that means. Is that if we have our a scalar uh, argument here, if a function is steadily increasing, then we would say according to this definition, it never varies. But if we had a function that even if it's monotone, if it starts to decrease, by this definition, it would be varying from the absolute value. So now the this is still going positive, right? And so it, its total variation would continue. But if the function made a downward turn, that is, if its derivative went negative, then we would say that it's varying from how it would behave if its derivative was always positive. So here, the function doesn't vary, and the function equals the integral of the absolute value of the derivative. Here, it, it's the function and the integral match until the function starts to turn downward. And so, this is one of the ways that we can measure it. This is the one we'll use, and it's a much more complicated picture. So, let's erase this, and we'll then apply it to one of our problems. Let's consider how basic calculus defines the derivative. Let's recall that the derivative of a function was defined as the limit as 
a scalar value approach zero of the function at the argument plus the scalar minus the function at the argument over the scalar. Now, suppose that we have discrete sampling, and that is what we're given is we're given w sub i. That is, now we'll think w here was a function, now we're saying w is a vector, and it's a vector that has a certain number of entries. For example, n. So now, it, now we can't exactly do this, right? So what can h be? Well, h has to be strictly greater than 0, because we can't have w0 if we have an index of 1 we have to have h less than or equal to n. That is, h has to be an integer. So what we'll do is we'll use this. We'll say that w prime for an indexed or discretely sampled uh, vector, we'll define that as the limit. Now h can't go to 0 h has to go to 1 of w. Now, instead of t plus h, that's subscript i plus h. Now we can see there are going to be some indexing problems. Um, minus w sub i, and we'll divide that by h. And then that very plainly has to equal the limit of this as h goes to 1 is just that. So w i plus h minus w i. And this is sometimes referred to as the forward difference. That is, we take the forward value minus the current value, and we'll take that as the derivative. So this is often simply defined, but we can reason it out by using some fairly elementary logic. So the total variation is this would be, now we can, if we're computing this forward difference, we can only do it for n minus 1, because we always have to be able to add 1, right? So that means that the total variation will be the sum as i goes from 1 to, now it's n minus 1, of w i plus h minus w i, quantity squared, because when we take that square, the integral of the square of the derivative, that turns into a sum, the limit, the integral turns into a sum, and then we simply take these, and then we drop the dt, because that's equal to 1, and now I'm going to make one tiny change to this. That was the forward difference, and we could equally well represent this as the sum as i goes from 1 to n minus 1, we could say, well, since we're squaring it, we could reverse that. And that's w i minus w i plus 1, that should be a 1 there, i plus 1 squared. And now we can ask, well, what does that look like? And what that looks like is, Let's start drawing this out as a problem. And because I see these, it's, this is going to be interesting. How can I compute this difference? Well, let's consider w1 minus w2. And that entry is, if I start out, I'm going to purposely make this just a little bit larger. If I start out with entry w1, I'm saying that this is w1 times 1 plus minus 1 times w2. And then this is 
w2 minus w3, which is the second entry in that difference vector, and that is 0, and I'll, so I'll just omit the 0, that's 1 times w2 minus 1 times w3. And then w, w3 minus w4 will be skip, skip, 1 minus 1 times w3, w4, and so on. And then at the end, we'll have w n minus 1 minus w n. So we see that this is one smaller. This, is, this has n minus 1 entries if there are n entries in our original w vector. So I can now write that as I can say that in the discrete form, the w vector differentiated is, has one fewer entries than the w. And that is, this is now an upper triangular matrix. Oh, that will end up with um, a 1 minus 1 there. Is that that'll be an upper triangular matrix, which it has n minus 1 rows and n columns times the W matrix. So now I can write that discrete regularizer in a number of ways, right? I can say that the total variation is, I can say that that is the sum as i goes from 1 to n minus 1 of, now I'll write that as wi prime squared, and I can then write this entire term as, so that is equivalent to saying that I'm taking my w prime vector and transposing it and multiplying it by the w prime vector. That is, that's the sum of the squares always equals this. And that has to equal, well, now w prime, what I can now do is I can say, well, that w prime is r times w prime transpose, and that is r times w. And I can then say that equals, well, that is the norm of r w squared. And so this form of total variation using the squared integral um, definition of total variation and then converting it into a discrete problem, that turns out to be the same as Tikhonov regularization where the regularization matrix r is this simple banded matrix.